happy hour. You know what we're going to do today? We're going to play. We're between books, and this being the, um, if you're watching it live, the last portion uh, before documentaries. So we're just going to kind of play and talk about questions and why we answer questions as we do. Uh, what do we base those answers on? And naturally, the answer, I hope you know, is the Word of God. So we're going to, we're just going to play a little bit. We're living in a generation that's extre exceedingly exciting. Why? Because it's the generation of the fig tree. And you're going to hear, hear the end of the millennium is, it's here, uh, it's a year 2000. Well, don't, and you have a lot of the doomsdayers and so forth that begin to act up. Yeah, we're pretty close. But don't let the year or the date shake you up, because um, I, I would just say to you, if um, if Christ was born in 4 B.C., as some think, or in 2 B.C., as uh, I feel he actually was, what year would it be? We would already be in that millennium, almost, coming right up to it. So man's calendar needs a little bit of adjusting, that's why we call Passover by the solar calendar rather than the lunar calendar. And another subject for another time, but wh why do I say this? Don't, don't, get it, don't let them see you sweat on your first cruise, all right? God knows what he's doing, and whenever the time is right, God will throw the switch and that's it. But we want everything his way, not our way. So relax in the word, and enjoy this season, enjoy this time as we come into this new millennium and know that our Father's in control so we don't have anything to worry about. Not one blessed thing. He will, whatever problems or difficulties that we get in, God will always show us a way out. Now let's document that. Where is that written? 1 Corinthians chapter 10. What, about verse 12 or 13, somewhere along there. You'll see it there. He, he always gives us that way out. We can, we're can-do type people and uh, when you're in his word. So, watch the commentaries if you must, but never let one of the doomsdayers shake you up. All right, we're going to... We're, we're just going to play with questions today and let it basically formulate the subject, and um, we'll see how it goes here. we got Bonnie from California, and Bonnie states, I'm an old cowgirl from California, and that's my type of people, I'll tell you for sure. And I have read and studied the Bible for years, but until I discovered you and the Shepherd's Chapel, I realized just how little I knew. I love your teaching. I feel as though I had a oneness with you. Thank you. Well, we certainly do. We have him in our oneness, and we have the word, and that word is powerful. I've been concerned for quite some time about baptism. As I have never been baptized, I am not a churchgoer because I have never felt comfortable in the traditions of men. That's fine. No problem with that. Is it possible or acceptable to baptize oneself in water in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit? Maybe this is a stupid question. Uh, Bonnie, no question is a stupid question. It's a good question, okay? But I would really like to know, as I feel the importance of baptism, and I definitely don't want to offend our Father. I love him, and I'm sure you do. And thank you for that, uh, Bonnie. Any Christian may baptize another Christian, and the method in which you have stated, what, what is baptism? Do, is, does the baptism have anything to do with, let's say, a so-called preacher? The answer is no. Now, uh, uh, yet at the same time, I hasten to add, if you're intending to join a particular, uh, which I'm sure Bonnie isn't, but if anyone listening should be, then by all means, you're going to have to be baptized by the laws of that particular denomination. But as far as God is concerned, I don't think John was keeping record down at Jordan. 
okay? When John said, repent and be baptized, and he had them by the droves down there, he didn't have a bookkeeper over on the side saying, now, that makes you a member for three years before your dues come back up again, and so forth. And, and I just in part, okay? Baptism is a very personal thing between an individual and the Lord Jesus Christ. A minister really has nothing to do with it. Christ was baptized by that same John. Why? Because he sets the example for us. So you feel um, comfortable, uh, and you might say, should we be baptized? And I can see that you are dealing with that. Christ was, and certainly showing us that we should be. All right, so I hope that helps you. Good to hear from you, Bonnie. The word baptism is something you, it, it does you well at times to break that word back in the Greek or the Hebrew, whichever you prefer. Hebrew probably better. And you'll find that it has to do with the, the etymology of it, with the dyeing of a piece of cloth. By that I mean taking it from one color to another. And you certainly can't sprinkle it if you want it to be dyed throughout the same color. It must be immersed in the water. That's the etymology of the word, and that's how it's done. Okay, then we're going to go here to Vicki from Michigan. Daniel 2.35, the word mountain, you said, translates into nation. Neither the Companion Bible or the Strong's bears this out. Well... I hope that, uh, you know, I do not use a script when I teach. And it's real easy to misspeak at times, and I'm glad you're checking it out. Because to say it trans to say the word mountain translates nations would be incorrect. But to say in most places it signifies or is symbolic of nations would be correct, because that's as it is. Example, you have two brass mountains that represent two nations in the book of Zechariah, and on and on it goes. Um, the seven mountains in the book of Revelation is seven nations, seven geographical locations. It symbolizes that. I think probably that's what I said, but hey, nobody's perfect. But you are correct to, to translate the one word as mountain, no, that would that, that won't fly. Uh, to say translate mountain as nation, but that's usually what it signifies. Okay, and um, God, our Father, uses He tries to make teaching easy for us, and 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 I I believe He does that. When he uses objects such as a mountain for nations and so forth to symbolize that, he is able to cover the truth from the eyes that aren't supposed to see it, but yet at the same time it makes it so simple for one that is natural, and he is supernatural, to be able to literally visualize the thought and the subject that he is in a sense portraying to us by using objects within the lesson. So, do not think it strange that God uses symbology. The book of Revelation is a vast book of symbology. And again, probably for the same reason. And why does he do that? He made it very clear in the fourth chapter of Mark and the tenth chapter of Matthew along about, I'm sorry, the 13th chapter of Matthew, along about verse 10, where the disciples themselves ask him, hey, why, why are you teaching in parables? You're using symbology here. Why don't, why don't you just tell us like it is? And he said, because it's given for you to know, but for them it isn't. So, in a sense... That's the reason God uses symbology in part. It's to simplify it for those that have eyes to see and ears to hear. And it's to perhaps make it seem like nonsense to those that are supposed to be um, passed over for the time being. And passed over, I don't mean because of their second-class citizen, 
but because they wouldn't have the courage to stand at any given time if God should need them, use them. Okay, David from South Carolina. Is it proper in the Lord's eyes to deduct our tithes from our taxes? Of course it is. It's, um, we live in a nation that is very blessed, and our government lets us, lets most churches operate under a 5013C. Uh, it is not, it is not, um, if your thought is that you're supposed to give in private, and not let anyone know what you give. That's not what it's taught. That's, that isn't the thought that is portrayed in the book of Matthew. Um, the thought in Matthew is don't do your giving publicly in a way to impress people rather than helping God's work. That was the thought. So naturally, it does not... Um, as a matter of fact, you should deduct your gifts from your taxes if they are given to a um, 5013C operating church or whatever that uh, charity might be. Uh, certainly, that's why it's there. That's why that our government um, allows us that. If you do not choose to, that's okay too. Everybody must do what they feel um, free to do, all right? And that's it. Okay, Armin from Texas. Are we saved by our works, or are we saved by Jesus and the works that we do will provide us a better place in heaven? I don't understand about the works we do here on earth. Well, naturally, salvation, the price was paid by the Lord Jesus Christ. Never... Uh, let anyone take that away from him. He gladly paid that price for us. And you are not saved by works, but by grace, meaning unmerited favor on his part. That we don't deserve it. But after repentance, he takes away those sins, and we are saved. It is interesting in the book of Hebrews that Paul teaches on this subject of salvation in the milk of the teaching. And he begins this chapter by saying, you really need to become perfect, is the way it's translated in the English, but it says mature uh, in the Greek. The word means mature. That you should be mature after you have been saved, then don't just keep hammering in. The, a teacher should not just keep hammering in salvation to that group if they're already saved. That's ridiculous. It's, a, it's a, an affront to God because um, after you are once saved, it's time to get into away from the milk, was the saying of Paul, of, uh, Paul and into the Word of God, the, the meat, the... the truth that goes to a deeper level that sustains you. Quite frankly, Christ does the saving, and once you're saved, you're saved. But when you slip and fall away from that, then you repent, and you're back, you don't get re-saved. That's an insult to Christ. That would be saying Christ couldn't do his part. So, and you will answer for all sins that you have not repented for. Now, as far as the works are concerned, or does that mean works are not good? Works are very good. The word judgment has more than one meaning, and, and unfortunately to the human being, usually when you say, it's judgment, oh, the, the, you know, you get all shook up and can only think negative because of guilt trips, but Christ forgives you. On repentance, hey, once you repent, he doesn't want to hear it again. It's over. It's gone. You'd better think of it like it never happened. And in as much as it never happened, by you bringing it back up again, even in your own mind, it's like saying, he didn't have the power to forgive me. He doesn't like that. 
God doesn't like to be put down. All right? So um, our works are the reverse of judgment in the negative sense, but are in the positive, as you stated. Your works, as it is documented, and we'll answer it this way. Why? Because it's written in the 14th chapter of Revelation, eh, along about verse 13, that your works are the only thing you can take with you to heaven. Everything else is is um, out of it. Your works are the only things that you can take with you. Why? It's your rewards. You're going to be paid rewards in accordance with that. Good question. Okay, um, then we're going to go to Marguerite from New Mexico. Revelation, what John was taken to the third heaven? Please answer. And uh, okay, Margaret. Well, St. Jo John, uh, John the Divine, the same John that wrote the Gospel of John, the John that uh, Christ loved, he was the servant that not only wrote that God utilized to take to the third heaven, if, you, if you're talking about the fourth chapter of Revelation, verse 1, he did. He took him up and he showed him the last day of this earth age. Your documentation for that is Revelation chapter 1, verse 10, whereby it is written, John was taken to the Lord's day. That didn't mean a Sabbath. The Lord's day, meaning the day of the Lord. Well, how long is a day with the Lord? Well, it's like a thousand years to us, meaning he was taken to the first day of the millennium. Revelation 1, 10. And uh, within that, um, he was taken there, and that's why he could write and tell us what he observed happening, because God gave him the vision way past where we are at this time. All he had to do was set it to the pen. Now, not only did he write St. John and the book of Revelations, that is, say, God utilized him, but he also wrote the epistles of John, all the same John. Okay, uh, Dwayne from Kentucky. Okay, um, we're going to keep up the good work. Also, I have a question for you concerning the last eight chapters in the book of Ezekiel. Okay, the blood sacrifices up on the altar, the altar of incense and the altar of sacrifice, both apparently are made of wood. There is no mention of them being overlaid with bronze, brass, or gold. The altar of incense referred to as, this is the table before the Lord. Okay. Thus, if a ram, a goat, and so forth, were to be placed upon a wooden altar, the whole thing would go up in smoke. Can you make a brief comment on that altar of wood? We listened to you on the big dish, and I was complaining when my wife bought the thing, but now I can see why she purchased it. Well, God bless her. Give her a big hug for me, will you? Okay. Why would... Well, and first of all, let's identify so that we can rightly divide the word. How are we going to answer this? How, how can we say it? I mean, it makes sense. It really does, that if um, God the consuming fire reaches down to take what is his, then it would seem, as Blaine said, that's going, that baby's going to go up and smoke, and that's not being sacrilegious. But remember this. The last eight chapters of the book of Ezekiel are in the millennium, and there will be no animal sacrifice there it is only written concerning the sacrifice because at that time, God has made it very clear, I don't want your burnt offerings. I want your love. So these altars during the millennium will be a place where through discipline, sacrificial love will be given. There will not be a blood sacrifice during the millennium 
even though it is used as a symbol of what an offering was. It is your love that he wants. Therefore, as God is the consuming fire that's documented in, well, I'll, I'll, I'll refer to the book of Hebrews. Let's take chapter 12, the last verse. But that same consuming fire is the Holy Spirit that will destroy some, but in touching us, it warms our heart. It feels good. It's his love. And that's what he wants in return. So himself being a consuming fire, and our type for this was given in the great book of Daniel concerning the three Hebrew children, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, as they were cast into a fiery furnace. And they weren't singed, and Christ walked with them in that furnace. You couldn't even smell smoke on them. Because God has a way of protecting us, that being only a type and an example whereby we could better visualize God the consuming fire today. His fire does not harm us. Uh, thus, with our love being the sacrifice given him, and how sweet he uh, says that it is. You could not send a more sweet savor to God than to let him know you love him. That makes his day. So the answer to your question, it is a in that dimension, that is to say, the dimension of the spiritual bodies in which we will be at that time. Um, the objects of worship and those things utilized in liturgical duty, uh, that is to say, serving God, we would come up short at this time in expressing them because it's in a dimension that uh, we cannot see at this time. It's going to be exciting, and um, I think that will. I think you'll get the point there. And it's a good question. Just take yourself to the Lord's day and realize that at the seventh trump, we're changed into a different body, different dimension, and um, the things that are wood, such as the building that the disciples were in after Christ's transfiguration. Christ, they could see him. But he walked through the wall. Now, we might say, well, which wasn't really there? Was the wall not there or was Christ not there? We would be incorrect on both counts because he was there and the wall were, was there, but there were two different dimensions. And, and this can, this is something that it is good to be aware of but not to make a religion out of it or to dwell on dimensions because no one, no one can totally and completely understand at this time the dimensions and one that has the ability to understand the dimensions in depth could do harm to tender ears that um, are not familiar with those actions that God will perform at that time, okay? So, I hope I didn't cloud the issue. It's simply that we will be in another dimension at that time, and the fire will not harm the wood, and there will be no blood sacrifices at that time, okay? Okay, Esther from Washington. Why were the other races included in the penalty of Adam and Eve's sin? Now, okay, see, you know, we had this question just recent, or it was really akin to it. First, let's identify sin. And to identify sin, we would go to the first epistle of John, chapter 2, and what verse is it? Am I going to have to turn there? I think I'd better, in case I throw somebody off on this. Little old epistles of John... Chapter 2, I'll be there in just a second. If I get out of the book of Peter here, I will. John, no, let's make it chapter 3. 
of the first epistle of John, and it is verse 4. Whosoever committeth sin transgresseth against the law. For sin is, I repeat, sin is the transgression of the law. All right? Now, I will answer your question by reading it again. Why were the other races included in the penalty of Adam and Eve's sins? They were included after it became law. There was no law up until Adam and Eve's time. That is not to say it was approved. That is to say the serpents meandering in the garden. But until God told Adam and Eve, of this fruit you shall not naga in the Hebrew tongue touch. Um, uh, had they? Well, we don't know. But something, some, a law must be spoken or put into effect before sin can transpire, all right? Because of that reading from the third chapter, fourth verse of the first epistle of John. They did not, and we're, uh, we all, um, how can I say this? None of us are perfect. We all fall short. And that leaves plenty of guilt to go around on all quarters, okay? The first commandment was, don't partake of that tree after the eighth day creation, okay? Uh, G.E. from Michigan, where is Mount Zion? Where is Where in Jerusalem? Is Satan going to sit in the Dome of the Rock uh, claiming to be Jesus? If not, which temple? I don't think Mount Zion and Mount Moriah are the same place. Well, that you you are, you have a, the right to your opinion. Mount Moriah was the a, a a hill or a point on Mount Zion that Solomon, when he built the temple, this is the same place that Isaac was offered up to the father by Abraham, and God stopped him. Mount Moriah at that time, there was a little dip that separated it from Mount Zion, but Solomon leveled the top of Mount Moriah, and that's where the temple was built by Solomon. Uh, I think if you, if you do a little research, you'll be happy to know there, were, there was more than one height or summit. It just so happened that was the highest, and that became... Even as we do documentaries and move out into the field, all the symbols where you will find the sacred name written uh, are, if it's Christian, maybe a fish drawn, which is the cipher for Christ. It's always on the highest point. That's why it's real easy to find. If, if there were worshipers there of basically almost any god, they go to the high point, and that's where they worship. So we'll, we'll let that answer your question. Okay, we'll take one more, and then we'll do a little break here. Marion from Kentucky. Do bad things have to happen to you before a prayer is answered, such as losing your job? Family members lying about you. Well, those ornery things doing that to you, Marion. Then your prayer is answered. This happened to me. Did I pray or ask in the in an important improper way, rather? I'm happy and my prayer was answered, but I'm afraid now because I can't afford any more bad luck to have my prayers answered. Can you give me guidance? I think so. I think probably Marion Marion that your prayer was answered because most people, God knows when you're serious, right? He knows when you're kind of trying to con him, too. And it's just the fact that most people don't get serious unless something bad does happen. And then they can really cry out, Oh, God! Oh, God, help me at this time. You know, but when things are going real good and you got, you know, 
good time Charlie, you know, God kind of corrected us for this in that great song of Moses, which we'll be singing at um, on the Lord's Day during the millennium. Revelation 15 documents that. And and he called us Jeshuan, which is a play on or Jez, on Jezreel, which is uh, Israel, good time Charlie. You know, anytime the good times go, God says you turn your back on me. But you get in a little trouble, and you start screaming out. So kind of like when bad things happen to us, it seems that's when it's man's nature to get serious with God. And it's important to know you can't con him. You're wasting your time if you're going to try to con him and put on a show for him because he knows what you're thinking. But when you really get right down to the nitty-gritty where the rubber meets the road and say, Father, help me, he's going to. And usually that point, unfortunately, is reached when we've had a little blow or something has brought it, kind of humbled us like, you know, made us a little meeker, meaning more humble before God. Okay, we're, hey, I'm enjoying this. Hope you are. We're going to pick it back up after the um, break here, and we'll get into some more questions. All right, listen a moment, won't you please? In plain sight. It's going to be available in our library, and all of you that follow us in documentaries, this should be your textbook. It will allow you to know how that we take the ancient alphabets, and they are included in part within this work. I trust that she's going to be doing other books as well, for she has a vast amount of knowledge and information and documentation that certainly, as large as this book is, almost 500 pages brimming full with all the pictures, all the drawings, did not hardly touch the research that she has done in her lifetime. So I know you're going to enjoy it, therefore I highly recommend that that is in plain sight. This will help you to say, I've kind of been there through the eyes of Gloria. Okay, let's have the 800 number if we may, 1-800-643-4645, and that number is good from Puerto Rico throughout the U.S., Alaska, Hawaii, all over Canada. The spirit moves and you have a question, you share it. Once you do that, we can no longer answer all questions, but we'll take a handful. Who knows? Yours may be there. Those of you that listen by short wave around the world at this time, it's always a pleasure hearing from you. Your announcer at the end of the hour will give you our mailing address. If you got a prayer request, he's your father. Again, as I stated a moment ago, don't try to con him. You can't. That's an, Im that's an impossibility. You can't put a show on for God. You've got to be real. And, and um, I, I really have a hard time understanding how someone could believe in God and still think they could con him. But let him know you love him. Boy, that makes points. It really does. Um, in a very good sense. Because it makes his day. And there is, as I stated earlier in the question concerning the sacrifice, the burnt offerings, he doesn't want that. He wants your love. He hungers for it. He craves it. It makes him feel good. I don't know how I could better say it. So don't hold out on him. Let him know that you love him. Father, around the globe we come, we ask that you lead, guide, direct, touch, Father, prosper. Heal in Yeshua's precious name. Amen. Okay, going to get right back into some questions. Uh, and we've got um, Robert from Alabama. Um, please, uh, two words he uses often, that's to say Pastor Murray, I need help with. I have no idea how to spell this. L-A-T-E-R-G-I-C-A-L, liturgical. Okay, well, it actually comes from the prime L-I-T-U-R-G-Y, liturgy, which liturgical uh, is a furtherance of the word. Um, you might say 
Now let's, let's see if I can put a sentence. You might say, uh, to be literate, the, uh, if one must, uh, to practice liturgical duties, one must be literate. Okay? Because, um, it means to have the ability or placed in a position to serve or do God's business. All right? It would apply in any language or any God, as far as that's concerned. But it means the service of God. And I, usually I utilize that word concerning the um, nephanim. Nephanim meaning uh, people that were, Nathan means given to service. All right? That's what the nephanim were. And in large part, there were many of those came back in priest robes from the captivity in the book of Ezra. And um, many people fall short in the book of Ezra by not knowing that these people were not qualified to perform liturgical duties. Okay, so that, that's, uh, uh, I hope that helps you. And sired is the other word, sired. Fathered as in offspring, that, that's right. I'm, usually I'm a begatter, all right? Whenever I use that word, I... I wasn't even aware that I used sired that much. But that's what, you're, you're correct. Farm people use terminology sometimes that may be a little different than what other people use. And sometimes we farm people can, and ranch people can get in much trouble uh, by utilizing some of the terminology we use around agriculture. And I'm going to start running away from that one right at this time. Uh, but there, there you got it. Hope that helps you, okay? Liz from Michigan. In Revelation, it speaks about only 144,000 getting into heaven. How can this be? Question. Are there not already that many there? Now, now Liz, you see, you've been, you've been listening to preachers again, all right? It's amazing to me the effect that preachers can have uh, giving a misconceived thought and how strong that thought can embed itself in one's mind from religion. Because there is no way in God's Word, in, and this would be in the seventh chapter of Revelation, that it says that those 144,000 that are mentioned there are the only ones getting into heaven. It's not even the subject. So, it would be real easy for me to say, Liz, who told you that? Because it's not true. And, Liz, I know you can read the Bible better than that. If you were to go read that seventh chapter, you would say, no, it doesn't the subject. The subject, which you always want to deal with with God's Word, or you're going to get confused. Try to put men's teachings totally out and just go back and read and stick with the subject, the object, and the article. And you're not going to go too far wrong. The subject, object, and the article is stop and hold back the coming of the Lord until after these people were sealed in their forehead. What's in your forehead? Your brain. In other words, that the truth was taught to them. Doesn't have anything to do with going to heaven. All right? These would be teachers. And it was necessary that they ha should have the seed of truth planted in their mind. And then, during the millennium, they will be used as teachers. You'll find that as the Levitical priesthood, they're called, it's a generic term as it is used in the millennium in Ezekiel chapter 44. But you see, you see what they did to you, Liz? You've heard so many people say, it says right there only 144,000 are going to heaven. And in fact, it doesn't say it at all. That's not what it says, see? So the, I would warn everyone, be careful. Uh, of what, I don't want to make this sound like I'm pounding preachers, would-be teachers. 
that can, that put thoughts in your head where you're not even reading for yourself because of what they've uh, brainwashed you with. And it's very difficult to jar someone loose from that brainwashing and get them back to the truth. Quite the contrary. Let me document. This is the, the when you answer a question like this, and that's what I'm trying to do with this is to show you how. Let your mind run. Her question was, I thought there were a lot more than that already. Well, there is. When you go back to the seventh chapter, um, where this is recorded, then back up one more chapter to six, chapter six. And it already says, it, it talks at one seal of there already being people that serve God under the altar. And, and all these others that have rop, washed their robes in the blood of the Lamb, which means in Christ's blood, meaning after Christ paid the price, that you couldn't count them. So uh, one would automatically, after covering chapter 6, knowing there was more there than you count. If somebody's going to tell me there's only 144,000 going to heaven, I'm going to say somebody's got a loose screw. Somebody's elevator doesn't go all the way to the top that's setting themselves up as a teacher. Now, I, I kind of bring that right down to earth because some people have to be jarred just a little bit to say, hey, think for a moment. That can't be. Now, do you run the risk in teaching using the shock treatment occasionally of offending someone? You bet. But that's the whole idea. Sometimes you have to offend people a little bit to wake them up and let them know how silly something really is. If you simply read the Word as it's written, sticking with, don't ever forget it, subject, object, and the article. You, you won't go too far wrong if you keep those three things in mind Man's not going to deceive you a whole lot. And you might say, and, and God doesn't expect, let's say, well, some might say, well, you expect everybody to believe like you do. No, I do not. I don't care whether people believe like I do or not. I want them to believe as God leads them from his word. I have never insisted that people believe as I believe. Because God didn't take man and put a cookie cutter. He's got different jobs for different people. And it's automatic. This is one of, the, one of the reasons that many times one Hebrew word or Greek word can have two or three different meanings. In most cases in translations, only one meaning was brought forth. And if you take that word back into the original language, by utilizing a Strong's Concordance, which is very simple. If you can work a Webster's Dictionary, you can handle that. Then it could be where one of those meanings is for me, the other could be for you. And you have to let the Holy Spirit lead you in these things and, and stand for something. Stand for yourself as a servant of God. Um, so it does not offend me that... Uh, that people, and there, are, there are many wonderful people that speak in tongues. That's fine. We're good friends. It's all right with me. No problem whatsoever. I let God lead everybody, and, and I, I'm sure not going to argue with him. Okay? So I just wanted to say that some people get a little heavy-handed in trying to plant seeds to insist, you've got to believe this the way I do. No, they don't. What difference does it make? God is dealing with them. Let God handle it, okay? That's my point. Okay, Willa Mae from Wisconsin. Who are the Gentiles also can a, can a bastard enter into heaven? Okay, the word bastard is memzar, and it means one that is of a, a Israelite father and a Gentile woman. It's not an illegitimate child. I will just straighten that out. If you could... Check me out in the Hebrew. Do it for yourself, okay? Gentiles are all of the races other than Israel. If you see nation in singular, that can be Israel. But if you see nations, plural, that most likely is Goyim or Ethnos in the Greek and the Hebrew there, okay? Uh, they're God's children. Paul was sent to the Gentiles. But 
each of us have things to do. As, and as I stated in the last lecture, Gentiles, as it, uh, ethnos, as it is, um, may I use the Greek in Revelation 21, verse 20 through 24, uh, they have their own kings and queens even in the eternity. And he's calling those out now, okay? Joseph from Connecticut. Matthew chapter 24, verse 38. The giving in marriage specifically, what does this term mean? What does it do? Go back and pick up the whole thought. Right, the subject of that 24th chapter is the return of Jesus Christ to us. And he gives us the events that will consummate the end of this age. And he said it's going to be just like it was in the days of Noah. They're going to be giving and taking in marriage. To whom? Genesis chapter 6, to the fallen angels. What does that mean then? It means that Je Revelation chapter 12, verse 7, Michael has kicked Satan and his fallen angels out of heaven, and they're here taking women again in marriage. That's why Paul would say in 1 Corinthians chapter 10 that a woman better keep a veil, I'm sorry, chapter 11, verse 10, at 1 Corinthians, that a woman keep the veil of Christ over her. It's translated hair, but hair has nothing to do with it. It's the veil of Christ. And that's why it says it's a shame for a man to have long hair, meaning a male would be having uh, to do with a, a male angel. All right? Got it? So that's what it's talking about. It's going to happen again. Okay, uh, Zira from Georgia. Dear Pastor Murray, one question, please. Was the Apostle Paul... Uh, living when Christ was on earth. Thanks. Yeah, pa Paul was most likely buried, uh, <laughs> buried, was born from the year 1 to 5 or 6 A.D. So if Christ was, let's say, j let's say that he was crucified at the year 30 A.D., that would make it, which is incorrect, but I'm using that. He would, he would be about 25 at that time. Okay, you got it? It is believed, not from the Bible, but from historical writings, that Paul was beheaded by Nero, so things didn't go real good for him in the final, later years after Augustus was uh, uh, taken out of the way. In about 67, 76 or 67 A.D. Now that, that's uh, man's history, so I don't pay that much attention to it anyway, okay? Kathy from Arizona. Yes, he was living when Christ walked the earth. Kathy from Arizona. I have a question. Revelation 22:15. Why were they not in the lake of fire? Okay. Um, in... Revelation 22:15, which is the final book of the book of Revelations, it speaks of the um, the uh, hypocrites, scorners, whoremongers, and all that business. Again, look real close to Kathy, and you'll find that what is it in the 12th, 10th, somewhere from the 10th to the 13th verse of that 22nd chapter, John was brought from the Lord's day back to um, about his uh, back to this earth age on the Isle of Patmos, and um, that, that's the reason it's there, okay? Uh, Ethel from Kentucky. What happened to the Apostle Paul? How did he die? Well, that's, uh, that's ironic. I just answered it, didn't I? It's believed historically that he was beheaded by Nero in uh, 67 or 76. My mind won't quite separate that for me. It doesn't matter, but... And, and I... I would not, um, I have trouble with that. Let me just put it that way. I have trouble with that because Paul was a Roman. Of course, Nero was a nut, too. But uh, be that as it may, he, they had nothing on him. And uh, I don't think a court would have done that. But they say that it was during the time of the Nero's persecution of the Christians. Yeah, it's worth mentioning because it could have been. Sandy from Oregon. What do I do? I have been saved for several years and now feel the need to be baptized. I called several known churches and no one would baptize me unless I joined their church. What do I do? 
any Christian can baptize a Christian. Now, if you decide you want to join one of those churches, then it's best to have it done there, because it would not matter if I baptized you or some other Christian. They're still going to insist that uh, they do the baptizing before you're in. Now, that's just the way it is, so truth is out. That's it. Mike from Iowa, you said that we should repent, repent, repent. How do you go about this? By repenting. Okay. I, repenting is to have a change of heart and let God know that you regret what you did. Those two things, and you got it made. He just repent to him, he will forgive you. And then one of the main things, Mike, you need to forgive yourself, too, or you're still not in too good a shape. Debbie from Pennsylvania. I know you are not a uh, racist, and I thank you. Oh, bless your heart. I think this was the lady I was answering a question just in a day or so, and I, I prayed that she'd not think uh, the statement I made was a racist concerning God's creation of the races. I appreciate that. We're going to clamp down this coming year on people. Many times when you teach the creation of the races, as I do, you get branded by certain organizations. Uh, we're going we're gonna to take a little of the starch out of their sales this year. And, Debbie, I appreciate that. That kind of gave me a second witness that was needed. Jake from Oklahoma. When Satan comes to the earth, what will be the extent of his powers? changing us into spiritual bodies, uh, sending physical pain. Well, he's an illusionist. He, he may uh, uh, cause one to think he had changed bodies, but no. Satan cannot give life. He can only bring death. Will he bring pain? I'm sure we won't be exactly happy when we see our brothers and relatives Pop it in the sack with him, I speak spiritually. When they're supposed to be such good church people, when he comes back saying, I've come to rapture you out of here, it, it's going to hurt us to see them jump in Satan's bed and to his marriage feast. Uh, it's not going to be nice. Um, but actually, God has a very tight rein on Satan. And you should determine that from Revelation chapter 9 where it stipulates you can't, don't even think about touching one of those that has the seal of God in their forehead, which means God's truth that can identify Satan for what he is, okay? He doesn't really, we have power over him. So that, that's documented in the book of Luke chapter 10 verse 18. Uh, God gives us power over all of our enemies, and certainly he is our enemy. Doug from Oklahoma, please document where God says to send a murderer back to him. I've checked Deuteronomy 19, and I can't seem to find it. Now, Doug? Okay, here's a good example of how, to, how can we answer that question, because it literally does not say, send him back to me. In Deuteronomy 19, but it does say, you're to execute him. So, uh, what happens to someone when they're executed? They die. What happens at death? Ecclesiastes chapter 12, verse 7. The spirit, which is the intellect of your soul, meaning your soul, instantly goes back to the Father. Okay? Axiomatic. Um, you have another shot at this. In Deuteronomy 20, I believe it is, where it speaks of what's supposed to happen to a rapist, you will have another shot at it in Numbers chapter 35, where it tells you what to do with someone, as it does in Deuteronomy 19, to do with someone that uh, commits manslaughter, that is, to accidentally kill someone. Um, then they are to be taken to a city of refuge, which is to say several ways away, so some kin doesn't um, kill him. But it says, send him back to me, in the sense it says, execute him. As a matter of fact, Numbers 35 is really good, because it says, if you don't send those murderers back to me, that means execute them, 
then you've got blood in your land and it can only be cleaned by me when you send them back up here. Your land won't have my blessings if you let murderers live. I believe that. Why? Because my father said it. And it's true. You'll find that in the closing verses of Numbers 35, if my computer isn't off. I believe that's right. Yeah, I know I'm right, okay? Numbers 35. Hannock from Oklahoma. Why is the tribe of Dan not mentioned in Revelation 7? But in Ezekiel 48, Dan is included. Please explain. Also, I know that Dan means judgment. It's, um, uh, think about it. If you had a companion Bible, there's a wonderful study given there. And, and this comes from that Revelation 7 we were talking about earlier. Um, it was because of idolatry. You'll find two of the tribes missing there, but they're reinstated in the millennium. In the, that's where the 48th chapter of Ezekiel is. I'm out of time. Hey, I love you all a lot. We're going to start Genesis as soon as I return from documentaries. And what a fantastic book. As it was in the beginning, so it shall be in the end. If you don't understand the book of Genesis, the creation, you can't understand the rest of God's Word, so don't miss any of it. Okay, stay in His Word every day, and His Word's a good day. You know why? Jesus, Yeshua, He is.